seven years ago, almost to the day, at the Geneva Motor Show, which for 2020 has been cancelled due to the coronavirus, Renault launched a small crossover. Its bold design attracted some interest, but I bet nobody seriously expected the Renault Capture, because this is what the car was called, would soon become the European B crossover segment leader. So the second generation Renault Capture has some big shoes to fill. I recall the Capture concept with the seats made of elastic strings. During car shows, Renault always goes to town with its concepts. It's a shame not much of that flair trickles down to production cars. In case of the first generation Capture, the seat pockets were replaced with the same elastic bands, which were useless in terms of storage, but I'm sure they inspired many a young guitar players to the joy of their parents. Meanwhile, Renault Capture was given a substantial facelift, which helped sales to continue growing. The French crossover had only one year when European sales didn't grow year on year, but the drop was insignificant anyway. Otherwise, until the very end of the first generation, Capture was the segment leader. The new Capture is larger, so as to better compete with other recently launched B crossovers like the Skoda Kamiq, which I reviewed recently. The Capture is now 423 cm long, it has 264 cm wheelbase, it is 180 cm wide and 158 cm high. I will say the Renault looks much more interesting than the Skoda, but that's for another episode. So the new generation is 11 cm longer than the first generation, it has 3 cm longer wheelbase, it's 2 cm wider and 1 cm taller. As a result, the boot volume increased from 377 to 422 liters, no power tailgate, by the way. I measured the boot and if you take into account the space for the spare wheel, the spare wheel being an option, it really does have 422 liters. There are shopping bag hooks, but put there by someone who doesn't know what they are for. There is a double floor, which you can lock in a slanted position to arrange things in the lower part of the boot, or you can drop it completely and find a lever to move the rear seats forward. Slide them and you get almost 540 liters of cargo space. Of course, in this configuration there is no legroom here whatsoever, but I assume if you have a toddler and a child seat, you need all the extra space in the boot for a buggy and other child paraphernalia. Now, when it grows up, you can slide the seat back and pray the next dozen years or so breeze by so that little bundle of joy moves out and hopefully doesn't turn you into grandparents too quickly because you have better things to do now that you've reclaimed your freedom. Unfortunately, even with the seat moved back all the way, legroom isn't ideal. Space in the back is claustrophobic, it's dark, it's tight. And the fact that my head is behind the C-pillar doesn't help either. It works great when you're in the back of a Rolls Royce or something, having a drink, an early drink, and you separate yourself from the middle-class plebs behind haute couture sunglasses, but from a point of view of a plebeian middle-class or in the back of a B crossover, you don't feel like a British monarch or even like Meghan Markle. Hashtag Sussex Royal. The door pockets are small, but you get two USB ports, a 12-volt socket in the back, there is no armrest, not even as an option, the seat pockets are no longer strings, I think that changed after the facelift. The doors cover the sills, so you won't get your trousers dirty on a rainy day. The first time I opened the door to the new Capture and I saw the cockpit, I took a moment to take an Instagram photo. I know this is a press car and it's specked out, but I switched from an even more expensive and less posh looking Skoda Kamek. Somehow I never felt compelled to take photos of the Skoda interior. 
The Renault Captur interior is beautifully finished and, at first glance, it seems very practical. Under the floating console, there is an induction charger with a light so you won't forget your phone. Above it is the gear selector, another cubby for smaller items, two USB ports, a 12 volt socket, physical knobs and buttons for the climate control, as well as some basic car functions. On top of the dashboard is a 9.3 inch infotainment system display, which Renault boasts is the largest in the segment, paired with a virtual instrument cluster. I raved about the Easy Link in my Renault Clio review. Click the link in the upper right corner of the screen or in the description below to watch that review if you want to find out more about the infotainment system. Also, my partner Anna has a separate review of the Renault's infotainment system and I'm linking to it below this video as well. As an option, you can specify cloth-like finish of the dashboard, which matches the exterior paint. And something I loved in the original capture, a drawer glove box. It's big. There are also cup holders, a place to put away the key card. As long as you accept Renault's avant-garde approach to interior design, everything looks good in the picture. But the devil is in the details. The interior feels cramped. The car is larger, but I feel there is less space from where I'm sitting. Insert a random fat joke, ha ha. But there is even limited headroom and at 175 centimeters, I'm not exactly tall. Access to backrest adjustment is difficult like in many other small cars. And if your smartphone doesn't have wireless charging or you want to connect Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you have to put it here and then with a cable plugged in or even without, a larger smartphone won't fit. My favorite drawer feels flimsy and you have to be careful with your finger so you don't get it caught between the edge of the drawer and the door handle. As usual, the multimedia joystick is hidden somewhere here behind the wheel. And I know if you've owned Renaults for the last 20 years, it's a brilliant idea. But if you haven't owned a Renault in the past, it's not such a great idea. Not a deal breaker, but I've seen better. Right, enough talking. Talk is cheap, as they say. Let's go. Before we move any further, I would like to address one feature which is invisible behind the steering wheel, just like the multimedia controller. And I'm talking about, hello, heated steering wheel. Whoa! This is the first time I, well, not literally, I can't see it because I have to lean out like this, but it's the first time I see a heated steering wheel in a French car. Now, interestingly enough, you can order it without heated seats. So, my hands are warm, but my butt in this test car is cold. Also, there is no lumbar support adjustment. My back doesn't protest yet, so maybe the seats aren't bad, but the jury's still out on this one. Visibility. The cockpit looks great at first glance, but first kilometers on the road are difficult. It's as if the Renault designers deliberately ignored visibility around the car. After a while, you'll get used to it, but just because after some time tight shoes stop hurting your feet, it doesn't mean that you're not getting blisters. Don't get me wrong, I really like the Renault Captur, but my sympathy for this car is not blind. I like it despite its quirks. So bear with me because the good stuff is coming. Meanwhile, let's get back to the not so good stuff. The steering, it feels too light at first. Add poor visibility and you can really be put off during your test drive. I made the mistake of taking it out on a dual carriageway for a couple of dozen kilometers, where I also found out it's very susceptible to crosswinds. The wind also exposed poor soundproofing. I complained about it, the poor soundproofing, in my Clio review. Above 100 km per hour, the wind noise is just too apparent. And with strong wind outside, at 60, 70 km per hour, it just gets too loud. 
There was also rain and I noticed another problem. Water collects behind this panel on the side window around the wing mirror and from there it slowly drifts across the entire window. This was clean water but dirty water will leave the side window stained and hard to see through. Also the wiper on the driver's side leaves too much glass untouched. Okay, from now on I'll talk about the positives. Mainly. The engine. This is an inline four-cylinder 1.3 petrol with EDC or Renault speak for a double clutch transmission. The engine is eager, smooth, relatively efficient. I'm averaging around 6 liters extra urban, closer to 7 in the city. WLTP result is 6.2 liters per 100 kilometers combined. I recall in the previous capture with a 1.2 liter engine I barely managed 6.5 combined. Besides the 130 horsepower 1.3 motor, there is also a 155 horsepower version and a 1 liter 100 horsepower one. The 1.3 petrol engine comes with particulate filter. And of course there is the 1.5 liter diesel, 90 or 115 horsepower. You can choose manual or automatic transmissions. Speaking of the automatic transmission, I know I was supposed to talk about the positives, so let's treat the next segment as a neutral observation. This floating console here means that there is no physical connection between the shifter and the gearbox. This is called shift by wire. Information from a switch under the gear selector is sent to a controller in the gearbox. Simple. Reverse, neutral or drive. So far so good. Many cars these days have this type of shifter. But in the capture it works without urgency. Imagine you're making a three-point turn. Simple. You turn forward left, stop, reverse right, stop, turn left again, forward and off you are on your way. But here sometimes you've finished reversing, pull the shifter to select D, you press the accelerator pedal and you are still reversing. You need to be careful, especially in a tight parking lot. I asked Renault about it and I was told the time needed for the controller to shift into drive or reverse is short. However, since the driver is not doing anything, it may seem longer than it really is. Mm. Okay, I'm familiar with shift by wire in other cars and I don't recall being bored waiting for them to shift. I asked some other car journals about it and several of them reported similar issues with shift by wire EDC in the new capture regardless of the engine variant. So it's not a bug, it's a feature, my fault, I was too quick. For safety, use auto hold. By the way, this test car has a 360 degree camera, which, as far as I remember, is the first in this segment, except for the fake 360 camera in PSA cars. The capture also comes with things like adaptive cruise control with active lane assist. It works all right, but it's not the best in the segment. The lane departure warning system is a mystery to me. It beeps at me unexpectedly and when I intentionally cut corners, it didn't even squeal. On less frequented country roads, as you speed between villages, it turns out the steering is not so bad after all. Moreover, the gearbox seems to recognize your pace and ships the car in the right gear so you don't even have to use the paddle shifters. And the suspension is excellent. It absorbs bumps well and holds the car glued to the road. Careful with the brakes though, because they bite quite low and in the back there are drums instead of discs. Prices of the Renault Capture start at just under 18,000 euro. This is the intense 1.3, 130 horsepower with EDC and it costs about 25,000 euro plus options that's about 31,000 euro. I know I wasted your precious time by listing all the faults in this car which doesn't have any faults. Well, yeah, that's just like your opinion, man. I like the Captur despite all its quirks, just like the first generation, which I thought was brilliant. I can't put my finger on it, but I think the Captur and me would get along 
just fine. And what do you think about the new Renault Capture? Do you think this one is going to be a bestseller like the first gen? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, press the notification bell. What else do you have to do these days? Turn on YouTube notifications in your mobile device. Yeah, whatever. I'll see you in the next one. I post every Friday. Thanks for watching.